Hi, I'm Chris Bachman. I'm the faculty advisor at Cal State LA for the Baja and Formula teams. And I'm putting together a short video here on the dynamics of a vehicle uh, while it's cornering, so making, making a turn. So as we did in the case of the longitudinal dynamic short, in the lateral case, we'll also begin by looking at some of the forces on the vehicle. So this vehicle is making a right-hand turn around the center of the turn here. To do this, it has a centripetal acceleration as a result of a centripetal force mass times acceleration and the acceleration being V squared over R. What's generating this force on the vehicle are the forces on the tires from the ground. And each one of these generates some component of this towards the center. And so if we begin to relate these, we can also begin to see that these forces are really what limit how fast you can take a high speed turn. And of course here, the larger the radius of the turn, the, the faster you can go, and the larger the mass, the slower you can go. Of course, this mass will figure into this lateral force as we'll see it next. So how do we start to generate some of this lateral grip? So let's pretend like we're looking at a tire that's rolling and we're looking from beneath and there's a glass floor beneath us. So this tire is pointing in this direction along this unaltered tread, but the tire is actually being moved in this direction along this velocity vector. And so this tire is allowed to roll and spin around its axes. So as it's spinning, as it's being pulled in this direction, the tire tread is coming down in, it's beginning to touch uh, the contact patch and it's beginning to get pulled more and more into the direction of the velocity of the tire. And after it becomes in, uh, out of contact with the ground, it'll snap back and go straight again. And so what you'll see that will happen is that the more and more you rotate this tire sideways, the more and more deformation of the tire you get, and the tire is like a spring, just like you saw in the longitudinal case, and this deformation of the tire will result in a lateral force. And so, and we can even, and kind of in the most basic models, we'll see that this lateral force will also depend on the down force on the tires or how far it's pushed into the ground. So like for the most basic model, you might just assume it has a coefficient of friction, right? Which is gonna be the lateral force normalized by the down force. But in our case, when we um, look at the tire data, which you should be looking at from the tire test consortium, you can see that one, this normalized lateral force, which you can consider kind of like a coefficient of friction. It's this lateral force divided by how hard it's being pushed down. And I am showing this for different amounts different levels of downforce pushing it down. And of course, many other things matter, you know, such as the inclination angle, that's like the camber on the tire, the pressure, how fast it's rolling, you know, the tire temperature, the wear, um, many, many factors will come into, come into play here, the surface. What you'll see is as you build up more and more slip, you're gonna get more and more grip until it begins to break away. And so you see these will maximize, you know, somewhere in the eight to 10 range. And even more importantly is what you'll notice is that this grip is highest when you have the lowest amount of downforce on each tire. And so this is the one reason why it's critical on the vehicles to have, to have you know, in the case of, case of cornering, to try and have, um, not have uh, uh, all the force on just the left side or all the force on the right side. And so having a big track width and a low center of gravity will help you, help you do that. And other things can affect, can affect the grip as well. And that can be like, for example, the camber. And so sometimes you'll see on vehicles, the front tires will be cambered in slightly towards the vehicle to help with grip. And so you just looking at our tires, what we see here is this is the side where you're actually kind of, you're getting some what would be called camber thrust. So a little help. We see with zero inclination, you know, we actually have the most, most grip. So these aren't, aren't exhibiting that in, in, in the case for our tires that we run. Uh, but you know, this should be something that you use to look at to decide you know, what should be your static camber, what should be your uh, camber gains through travel to optimize your grip uh, throughout a turn. You should also keep in mind that, the, that these values are done on a tire test machine and that they have a different surface than what you're gonna be driving on. And you should typically be multiplying these values here by about 0.6 to mimic what you would in the, what you would on the typical asphalt surface that you'll be racing on. And so, you know, these 2.5 areas, you're probably gonna be looking more like your lateral grip is more like 
more like 1. Point, you know, 1. 1.7 in those cases. And so this is what we've been talking about for a formula vehicle so far. But you know, I pulled up some old data for a Baja vehicle as well, and you'll see similar trends. One, you see as you increase the downforce, you're going to have increased, or you're going to have decreased uh, grip. So decreased lateral force divided by how hard you have to push down. So you want to have as little downforce on each tire as possible. The other thing to notice is the order of magnitudes are different. So here, you know, 0 0.6 is the max grip you're going to get. Um, and that shouldn't be overly surprising. And you're doing it at much bigger slip angles. So if we put this together and begin to look at the sum of all the lateral forces coming from each one of these, coming from each one of these tires, so each one will have some slip angle, some slip angle built up. We'll have the each one will contribute its downforce times its uh, normalized lateral force. But because each one has a will have a different slip angle and can have a different uh, a different downforce. We will have kind of a just for this portion, we'll just use a weighted average. Of course, you could go in and get the actual values for each one, but having a weighted average, which will tend to be weighted, which will be weighted by the downforce. So the tires with the larger downforce, which will typically have lower grip, are going to be the ones factoring factoring mostly into here, and all of the downforce will add up together to be the weight. So that's kind of nice because when we look at the acceleration in the lateral direction, it's going to be equal to the force divided by mass. The mass is canceled, and we can see the most lateral acceleration we can get is based on this weighted uh, normalized lateral force. And so this will help. This kind of is why you have these um, traction circles and why you can kind of quickly look at the grip of the tire and see what's the max traction you can get. And of course, you can also begin to relate this to, you know, how fast could you go in a turn? So let's next, let's begin to look a little bit more about uh, getting into this weight shift and how it affects the downforce on each of the tires. So we look at a vehicle and we already went over the relationships between the uh, centripetal forces and the centripetal acceler acceleration and how the centripetal uh, acceleration is related to the velocity. And what we can look at, look at next is that we also know that the two normal forces, so I'm splitting this car um, and just putting the right side tires and the left side tires together, but the total forces on your left tires and your right tires are going to add up to your weight. But as we know, in a turn, we're going to have some weight shifts. So I've drawn, drawn the vehicle here with doing a right-hand turn, so forces are to the right on the tires, as well as it's accelerating to the right, but I drew the minus MA to the left at the CG. And so if we begin to look at these forces on the left tire and the right tire, we can relate them to the normal force on the left times the normalized uh, lateral force on the left tire, and the same with the right. And so you can begin to see now that, you know, if you put all of your weight on your left tire, you're going to have a low normalized lateral force for your left tire. And so your, all of your grip is going to be related to this normalized lateral force. And so what you'd rather have it is have it split, split between the two so you can have a higher, higher total grip and you can go faster around the turns. So how much of this weight is getting shifted? So uh, we can, to figure this out, we can do some of the moments about the, about the right, right wheel, uh, about the x axis. And we'll include the minus MA term as well as all the forces that have a moment arm. And what you'll find is the normal force on the left tire will be related to half the weight plus this term that includes the weight shift. So assuming that the CG is centered on the car laterally, then you'll, uh, under static conditions, you'll have half the weight on the left and half on the right. And as you make a right-hand turn, more will get shifted to the left based on the mv squared over r term, which will be your, um, your uh, it's going to be your mass times acceleration times the height of the CG over the track width. So what you can already begin to see is in order to minimize this, what you will want to do is decrease the height of your CG so you have less weight shift and increase your track width. And that'll help you get more grip as you go around, go around the track. So a lot of these fundamentals uh, help you, will help you think about the 
help you think about the design of your vehicle. Um, and keep in mind that this is independent of, you know, your roll center, um, any of your, you know, roll stiffnesses, anti-roll bars, right? So your, your weight shift is dependent on the geometry of, of your vehicle and not, not any of these setup, setup parameters. And that's a common misconception uh, that I find with the students. Another important consideration uh, when you're cornering with your vehicle is not only will you lose grip with the ground and not be able to complete the turn, but there are some cases where your vehicle will actually flip before losing grip. And this is especially important in the case of Baja vehicles where you need some ride height to uh, go over different obstacles. So the way you analyze this situation is, again, we look at the, the vehicle making a right-hand turn, but here we assume that um, because, because we've had so much weight transfer all the way out onto the left rear of the vehicle that all the weight is out there and that it has migrated to the far left, uh, the contact patch centers migrated to the far left of the tire. And so what we do at this point is we analyze the sum of the moments about the center line of the vehicle at the ground. And we have two terms. We have the normal force times the half the track width plus the tire width causing this to rotate clockwise. And we have this minus MA vector acting at the height of the CG, causing it to rotate counterclockwise. And so if that term, so the acceleration being uh, V squared over R is greater than the moment created on the wheel, then your vehicle will flip. You can rearrange this slightly to be able to figure out, okay, for a certain track width and tire width, and CG height, what's your maximum uh, lateral acceleration or velocity uh, that you can take a turn at for a specific radius. So this, this is tested on the tilt test in the Formula SAE competition by inclining the vehicle at 60 degrees. So this angle in here is 60 degrees. And so you can imagine this line will become completely vertical in the tilt test. And it's checking that your CG is in, within this area. And the reason, that relates to this is that this 60 degrees in here, the tangent of that 60 degrees is equal to this term being the opposite over the adjacent. And so you'll see if you take the tangent of 60 that it's around 1.7. And so this tilt test on a formula vehicle is checking that you can make a turn at 1.7 Gs. And so these would be, give you some restrictions on the height of your height of your CG or some requirements on your track width if you're looking to hit certain lateral uh, acceleration targets for your Baja or formula vehicle. Putting, let's put a little bit of this together. So let's put some of the, begin to put some of the corning and drive dynamics together. So this is again, some data from the tire test consortium, which is invaluable. So, you know, a lot of the start of design your vehicle should start with understanding some about your tires. But let's look at this one case with the downforce of about 150 pounds, zero inclination angle, uh, pressure of 12 PSI, velocity of 25, and a slip angle of six. So um, we don't, don't necessarily worry about the, worry about the, whether it's negative or positive in this case, but you, what I'm showing here is the normalized lateral force versus the slip ratio. So this is how much lateral grip do you have versus how much are you driving the wheels forward? And what you'll begin to see is that in this yellow case, is as you drive the tires forward more and more, you're gonna decrease your lateral grip. So you can't, so if you're trying to accelerate, you can't turn as hard as you would when you're not trying to accelerate. And so that's why you can't you know, accelerate uh, and turn as strong as you can just turn or break and turn as, uh, uh, as well as you can just turn. And so that's why you know, at the apex of your turns, you're typically not gonna to wanna to be also braking and accelerating right at, right at the apex. All right, so putting this all together, we can now begin to look at the performance envelope of our vehicle on a GGV map. And the Gs just stand for acceleration and the V stand for velocity. And so you're looking at the longitudinal acceleration forward and back versus the lateral left and right possible accelerations as a function of your vehicle velocity. And so you'll see at low velocities, you'll have this kind of elliptical type shape, which is governed by the grip of your tires. What you'll notice is that the usually the maximum forward acceleration for a two-wheel drive vehicle will be much less than 
the acceleration at which you can brake because there you could be using grip on all four tires. You see this value might be slightly more than your max potential lateral acceleration. But again, that would depend on your tires. And as this velocity goes up, you no longer have all, uh, you don't, no longer are traction limited, but propulsion limited by your engine. So that's why this face will start to table back up to your top speed. Another phenomenon you might see is that the entire, um, entire surface will start to taper out at higher velocities if you have an aero package that can provide you with some downforce and more grip. So let's look about look at uh, how you might navigate around this performance envelope in a simple scenario where you're starting from a standstill, you're going to be going into a right-hand turn and then accelerating out of it. So if you're starting off at a standstill, you're just going to be at the origin. And as soon as you hit the gas pedal, you're going to immediately come to this point and maximize your longitudinal acceleration and have zero lateral acceleration. And you'll be accelerating as much as you can, increasing your velocity, traveling up straight up the face of this performance envelope, if you can, all the way until you reach top speed, maybe halfway through some of the straight. And then you can just sit at zero longitudinal acceleration up until you reach point two, which will be slightly before the turn in because you'll want to slow down. And so when you hit the brakes, so this is point two, I'll circle that, it's point two, and this is point one. And then as you hit the brakes, you're going to immediately come back to the backside and you're going of this envelope and you're going to be decreasing your decreasing your speed traveling down the backside of this performance envelope until you until you reach the apex where you begin the turn in. At this point, you need to have some lateral acceleration inside the turn and you might be braking somewhat and you're going to come around the face of this performance envelope until you're going to be hitting point three, where you're having pure lateral acceleration and no longitudinal acceleration, kind of on this right face facing us. And you'd be doing this through the apex of three until you're coming out of the apex of three and you want to be getting back on the accelerator. And then you'll be coming up this face until you, until you reach four, where you'll begin to, out of the turn, to just be uh, accelerating longitudinally and back. So this may be around 0.4. So, so that's the, the way, so that's, so that's the reason why we look at these performance envelope is because uh, ideally you'd be navigating along this performance envelope to maximize your performance. And of course, um, if you haven't checked it already, check out our overall vehicle uh, design uh, video because it'll be explaining the other key aspects to allow your driver to be able to actually sit on this envelope of the performance window uh, of your vehicle. So, but keep in mind, we've kind of been thinking so far as the car is a point master. There's one other aspect to cornering that you might want to spend some time looking into. And I'll just mention it briefly here and some of the fundamentals. And that is that your car, as it goes through a turn, it needs to yaw, it needs to rotate. When you make a 90 degree turn, your car goes from goes from facing straight ahead to turn 90 degrees. So you also need the ability to rotate your vehicle. So, so in a similar way that the, some, of the forces, um, some of the forces can cause lateral accelerations on your, on your vehicle, you can also have the moment on your vehicle divided by the moment of inertia can result in yaw acceleration of your vehicle. And so what I'm drawing here on the left, I'm trying some of the important terms is if you have a vehicle, I'm drawing a bicycle model, just the rear and the front tire. And this vehicle is, is velocity is straight ahead, but it's facing slightly to the right. And so we call this beta, the vehicle slip angle. So it's the vehicle is rotated slightly clockwise relative to the relative to the velocity. And the front tire is also steered slightly more than that because you've rotated it clockwise into the turn. And I'll use the symbol delta for the steering input. So both of these two terms will be able to help you find the slip angles on the tire. And what we did before is we found the slip angles and you can multiply that by what we called before was the cornering stiffness. And whether you assume that's linear or if you you know, get the slip angle and you go and you know all the other parameters and you go into the curve and get the actual lateral force, the latter probably being a better method. 
will help you find what's the force on the front and the force on the rear. And you imagine in order for right-hand turn, you need a net moment uh, clockwise, which will turn your car. And so you need a larger force on the front than a force on the rear. Uh, and so you can see immediately that in order to, you know, be able to accelerate in yaw as much as possible, you also want to limit the moment of inertia of your vehicle. So you want to bring all the mass of your vehicle as close to your CG as possible. So that's another common design feature that we're thinking about and steadily marching our components towards the center, center of the car. Um, and that's why you might see, you know, brake calipers and such also, you know, fit on the down, on the bottom side of the tires and also towards the center of the car, keep the CG low, keep the rotational inertia of the, or the, you know, the moment of inertia of the vehicle low. And keep in mind, this is also different than the rotational inertia of your drivetrain system, which could affect your longitudinal acceleration. And once your car's, once your car's um, is going to be yawing, you also have uh, some other terms to think about. And so, for example, I'm drawing the case here where your car's velocity is straight ahead and you have no steering input, but you do have some yaw. So, so you have this uh, theta z, which is you're yawing uh, about the CG. And what you'll see in that case is that will also build up some slip angle because you have this omega r term, which is, la which is gonna be lateral and the velocity. So you're actually typically gonna look at three terms that will affect your that will affect your slip angle. And so this alpha is supposed to show the slip angle of the front, but you'll have, you'll have both your yaw, your steering input and your vehicle slip angle. And typically you'll input the first two when you're, sol when you're actually solving for some of this, uh, doing, your, doing some either yaw, yaw moment or yaw acceleration versus lateral acceleration graphs. And then you'll solve for what your yaw must be in steady state. And so keep in mind a lot of what we've been doing so far in the turn is assuming, assuming a steady, uh, steady state turn. And you can then uh, with you know, lateral acceleration is V squared over R and this velocity can be related to omega R where this, you know, omega is just a, uh, an angular velocity. And you can say that you know, based on the forces that you're getting, what is your lateral acceleration? And if you want to do the calculations at a fixed radius, you can use that to find, you can use that to find your, your omega, or if you assume it's at a fixed velocity, which is more common, you can use that to, to find your omega. And usually you'll do a couple of iterations. So let's look at the, this performance of the vehicle on a yaw acceleration versus lateral acceleration. So this is like the performance envelope that I showed before, but this time we're thinking a little bit about yaw accelerations. So what these graphs is you have this envelope, this black line of potential performance. And a couple of key things we look at at the start is one is the grip, which we've been talking about a bit. And so you don't necessarily need to look at this graph to get that information. But if you have this graph, that's one thing we're checking is the grip. And so that's how far to the right this point is. And then we're thinking about the yaw acceleration. So is it rotating clockwise, which is stuff up here, or is it rotating counterclockwise? And so what we think about is when you're on the full turn, are you rotating more clockwise? You'd call that balance would be oversteer. So the car is rotating more into the turn um, as, you, um, as you have large lateral accelerations. You might also begin to think about things like control. So control we define as the case where you have a fixed vehicle slip angle and you increase the steering input. In that case, what you want is for the driver, you know, for example, if they're going straight ahead as they steer the car more and more, you want that to produce a clockwise, you know, if you turn the wheel clockwise, you want that to produce a clockwise turning of your vehicle as much as possible. So you want this slope, which we call the control to be as high as possible. And, you know, usually we take that point about the origin, but of course you could take that, you know, derivative about, about anywhere in this plot. And the same thing with stability. So it's in a similar way, you think about if the steering input is, is fixed straight ahead and the car is rotated slightly, you want it to rotate back. And so what you want is as this vehicle slips clockwise, you want a restoring moment to restore it back to going straight ahead. And so you want the stability to have a large negative slope, slope right here. All right, so let's begin to look how we would navigate this performance envelope as we did with the GGV graph previously. 
So initially, as we're going into a corner, or even during all the times when we're on the streets, we're just going to be at the center of this graph. And so this graph is really applicable during cornering situations. And as we go into a corner, we know we want to go towards the maximum lateral acceleration as we hit the apex. And as we come back to the straight, we'll want to come back to this point. And let's pretend we're making a right-hand turn. We know we're going to have to turn clockwise. And so as we initially add some steering input, that word is going to allow us to begin to begin to have some uh, yaw acceleration and begin to rotate in the clockwise direction and begin to excel laterally. And we will continue, continue to do this until we we'll reach our maximum yaw acceleration. And then, and then what we'll do at, at that point is we want to begin to hit the apex of the apex of the turn. So we'll come back down and we'll hit near the the maximum lateral acceleration that we could. Typically this point, I've exaggerated it being away from the horizontal axis just for visual purposes, but it'll be much closer. So if I could, I'd have it come down closer into this point. Um, but just for kind of the graph's sake, we'll come down here until we hit our maximum lateral acceleration near the apex. And at this point, we don't have any yaw acceleration, but keep in mind, we have maximum yaw velocity. So we're still turning clockwise uh, at the fastest rate as we have been this whole time. So we need to decrease that because we know we want to come back to this zero point. And so we actually need to go through a phase of negative yaw acceleration to decrease our yaw velocity. And we're going to come back again in kind of a circular fashion. So this will kind of be kind of an ellipse or a circle uh, coming back to the origin before the straightaways. And so keep in mind this, you know, maximums are could be several hundreds of degrees per second. We're usually not going to be operating near the maxes. Those would not be very stable or uh, controllable situations uh, in the in those cases. And so, um, and that's why you also kind of hear me mention that you know this yaw acceleration. It's not as easy to relate to exactly how will it limit your lap time as the GGV plots, as you really sitting along, you know, potentially sitting along the envelope the whole time. But these are important concepts to understand and track with your vehicle performance and be able to help you do the correct setup. So let's look at a couple of examples next. So looking at the yaw moment versus lateral acceleration graphs for a Formula SA vehicle, um, you can plot them in two ways. Sometimes you plot the yaw moment uh, and usually normalized by the weight times the wheelbase, or if, even better, if you know the moment of inertia reveal, you can actually plot the yaw acceleration, but you can look for similar key things in both graphs. So the first thing you look at is typically, okay, how good's your grip? That's going to be a big driver of performance. Next, you might look at the balance. So at this max grip, are you slightly, uh, are you slightly having positive yaw moments, which would be an oversteel vehicle, or if this point came down here, this would be an under, uh, you'd have kind of a slightly understeer setup. And the other thing I've began to do is each one of these lines, so these lines right here are for a specific vehicle slip angle, and these lines right here are for a specific a specific steering input, is I took the derivative of this with respect to the steering input. And so this will give you a quantity, and so you know how the slope of this line, and this will kind of tell you, okay, well, you have this value for control in terms of pounds, force, inch per degree, or you could you know, do a, you could also do it in terms of the yaw, yaw acceleration. So we have, you know, decent control and, you know, looking at a similar graph, but looking at in case to case, the stability, which is the slope of this line. So this line, because you're, uh, you want it actually to go down and to the right, but um, in terms of the actual differential, you're, you're going to be going down in this direction, but going down this direction also is going from more negative vehicle slip angle. So you actually want this value to be slightly positive. And you'll see these are more around zero since stable, stable vehicle in this case will be, uh, in terms of taking this differential, will be slightly above zero, which will mean this line is going down. Um, so it's just, you can tell it's pretty flat here and just barely going down. So just barely stable. We look at a similar thing for the, similar thing for the Baja vehicle. Um, You'll see that there'll be more vari more variation in the control the control of the system, and you'll see that we'll have decreased grip immediately because we're operating on dirt. We'll have less yaw moment. We again have a slightly 
oversteer vehicle. But there's one big factor for these Baja vehicles we're not taking into account, at least in the simulation that our team's using, that we're not modeling the behavior of the differential in the rear, which is a lock diff, which will typically tend to, because you'll have higher slip angles on the inside rear tire, will typically cause you to understeer. And to counteract this, you'll see a lot of teams, what they'll do is they will have a lot more of their weight transfer in a turn on their rear axle by having really stiff rear shocks or an anti-roll bar in the rear. And what that does is that loses grip in the rear because you have a lot of weight transfer in the rear. And we saw weight transfer will typically uh, decrease your grip and that will result in your vehicle having a little bit more oversteer. So you're counter countering the understeer from the lock diff with a really stiff rear axle to allow your vehicle to you know, complete the maneuverability portions. And you can go and look at the stabili stability of the Baja vehicle and, um, and you might wanna just do this for different setups. And so um, what I find in practice is that the, the, the GGV plots will have you know, a lot bigger predictor on the performance of your vehicle and that the actual you know, moment of inertia and your ability to yaw, you're operating less near the, the limits but this um, still has a lot of implications on your performance and has a lot to do, I think understanding these principles are very important in terms of um, how to set up the vehicle and understand how your vehicle is behaving, behaving while you're turning. So if you wanna figure out more, we have a lot of videos on you know, making some of these graphs in our workshop series and more about cornering in our workshop series where we do the derivations, we do example problems, uh, and uh, watch out for our next video coming out, which will be uh, more details on the suspension and about controlling the distribution of uh, load transfer, which is very critical for the vehicle. All right, good luck out there.